Um, so I'm Nicole Carney and I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land upon which I work here in Melbourne, Australia. The Boon Wurrung and the Woi Wurrung peoples of the Eastern Kulin Nation. But I would also like to acknowledge the Indigenous peoples across the whole of Australia because that acknowledgement is completely missing in the historic literature I work with. These illustrations are from the late 1700s and the early 1800s. This is a period in our history when these animals were being discovered by Europeans. The publications contain no acknowledgement that there were already a people on this land who had an intimate knowledge of these animals. Australia's animals were unlike anything that the Europeans had ever seen. But of all of Australia's animals, it was the platypus that they found the most bizarre. It had fur, but it also had webbed feet and it had a beak like a duck. And weirdest of all, it laid eggs. It changed the Europeans' understanding of the animal world. And it changed everything. And so the early literature of the platypus is hugely significant, but it's also really hard to find. I'm going to talk to you today about why that is and what I've been doing to make historic platypus literature infinitely discoverable. Platypus infinitely discoverable. Pig. I'm going to use how we've been doing that using retropids. So what's a retropid? A retropid is a retro retrospectively assigned persistent identifier. Now, I believe that's a new term. I'm pretty sure it's a new hashtag, and I'm really hoping that it catches on. I'm here today to try and convince you of three things. The first is that the historic literature is still really relevant, and it's cool, retro cool even. Now, retro cool is not a new term, not a new hashtag. Something that's retro cool is something that's so uncool that it's cool. Kind of like persistent identifiers, and I'd like to have a big shout out to Peter Palooza for all their efforts to make PIDs well and truly retro cool. The second thing I want to convince you of is that historic literature should be open access. And I'm talking about the literature that is out of copyright and in the public domain. And hopefully I won't have to convince you, too many of you of this, because that's what I spoke about at Peter Palooza in 2019. The third thing I want to convince you of is that the historic literature is desperately needing retro pids, those retro, retrospectively assigned persistent identifiers. To make my arguments, I'm going to take you on a journey back, on, back in time, not too far to start with, just to the 1970s, the home of all things retro. If you wanted to read a journal article in the 1970s, you had to go to the library. And there on the shelf would be all of the articles published in that current year as well as that decade and all the way back to the beginning of the journal that you were looking at on the shelf in front of you. In the case of this journal, back to 1868, scientific knowledge at your fingertips. Now, I was born in the 70s, but things were pretty much the same when I went to university in the 1990s and early 2000s. It took exactly the same amount of effort to read and to find and read a contemporary article as it did a really, really old one. Things have changed. This interesting piece of information popped up in my Twitter feed. It's the announcement of a new discovery of a new species of pygmy seahorse. Now, this really interested me. And there in the tweet is a DOI, a persistent link through to the primary literature. And if I wanted to know more about pygmy seahorses, there in the reference list are more DOIs, links that I can click on and be taken on a never ending chain of knowledge through the literature from the comfort of my desk but there are PIDs missing from that reference list, most often from the old stuff. And that keeps me awake at night because now that it's so easy to find and read the new stuff, researchers are much more likely to read and, start, read and cite the modern articles and the historic literature is falling into obscurity. This really worries me on a personal level because I love old stuff, but also on a professional level. I manage the Australian branch of the Biodiversity Heritage Library which is the world's largest virtual library of biodiversity heritage literature. It's a global consortium of over 500 libraries around the world who are digitising their biodiversity heritage literature, making it available online. Together, they've uploaded over 59 million pages, and those pages contain information on millions and millions and millions of the world's species, and it's all openly accessible. But that's not enough, because accessible doesn't equal discoverable. The vast majority of the historic literature lacks DOIs, and that means that it sits outside that linked network of knowledge. But if we want the historic literature to be both discoverable and persistently citable, it needs DOIs. So last year, I started a persistent identifier working group within the biodiversity community in order to bring the historic biodiversity literature, that foundation of all biodiversity knowledge, into the PID graph. But it's not as easy as it sounds. Oh, we're going backwards, sorry about that. 
not as easy as it sounds. Retrospectively assigning DOIs means retrospectively gathering and checking all that metadata. And that's a huge amount of work. And I didn't have the people or the resources to do this. But then 2020 was cancelled. Our entire scanning operation at BHL Australia shut down in March. And with no access to our books or our scanner, we had to come up with work that we could do from home. And this gave us a really unique opportunity to work on improving the discoverability of our existing online content. During 2020, my BHL staff and volunteers manually gathered article level metadata or they or cleaned up article data that we were able to scrape from websites or download from catalogues. And they did that for over 30,000 articles, articles that were already online but weren't discoverable because they lacked article level data and DOIs. I'm going to focus today on just three of those 30,000 articles, three platypus that until very recently were lost in that sea of historic literature. The first is from the Proceedings of the Zoological Society of London. Here it is on the Biodiversity Heritage Library website. It's called Notes on the Duckbill, Monotherenca sanitinus by George, George Bennett. Our version is open access, as it should be, because it was published in 1859. There's another version online, on the Wiley Online Library website, but it's behind a paywall. If you want to download and keep a copy of this version, it's going to cost you 49 US dollars. Wiley has assigned a DOI to every single article in this journal, all the way back to the very beginning, back to 1830. And because their versions have DOIs, that makes their versions the definitive versions that everyone has to cite as part of that linked network of scholarly research, which makes it doubly upsetting that they charge for access. But I'm not here to talk about ethics. That was my talk in 2019. I'm here today to talk about retropids and discoverability. It's great that Wiley is retrospectively assigning DOIs to historic articles. However, when I searched for this platypus article on the Wiley website, I had a lot of trouble finding it. And that's because the only metadata that Wiley has attached to this DOI for these early back issues is the date and the name of the person who chaired the meeting on that date. So these are proceedings. These are publications of meetings. And the data there is the meeting level metadata, not the article level metadata. At these meetings, people presented their scientific papers and these papers were subsequently published in the proceedings. And none of that article level metadata, the titles or the authors, is in Wiley's website. They haven't got that metadata, so all of these articles are undiscoverable, including this platypus one. This is the outmetric wheel for that article. It's showing zero readers and zero sharing ever. During 2020, we worked through all the back issues of the proceedings of the Zoological Society of London, and we manually collected all the article level metadata. We found that at that one meeting in June 28th, 1859, there were 15 scientific articles read and then published about a wide variety of animals. None of this article data has been discoverable before now. We added the article level metadata to the Biodiversity Heritage Library website, which means that these articles are discoverable, both within the BHL website and via external search engines. But they still lack DOIs, which means they sit outside that linked network of knowledge. And my next step is to go to the Zoological Society of London and see if they'll consider allowing us to assign DOIs to these articles that don't have them. And th those will then point to our website, which is open access. I'm kind of assuming that they're going to say, well, we want our DOIs to all point to the same place on the Wiley website. And I'm quite happy to hand over our hard-won metadata, but providing Wiley decides to keep those open access. So stay tuned. I'm now going to take you a little further back in time to 1832. This article is from the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society of London. And the illustration is not quite as cute as the last one, but it's incredibly significant. And that's because that's a mammary gland. This is the paper in which Richard Owen in 1832 confirmed for the world that this egg-laying platypus is indeed a mammal. The Royal Society of London has all their back issues on their website and they've assigned a DOI to every single article and their metadata includes both the article titles and the authors, which would make this article discoverable if it weren't for the fact that there's a spelling mistake in that scientific name. Now they've done what a lot of people do when they're dealing with historic content and they've relied on the OCR. Usually it works, but not always. Their op optical character, character recognition software has read that final H in the scientific name as an L and an I, which means that anyone searching for information about the platypus via its scientific name is not going to find that article. Again, the outmetric wheel, zero readers, zero sharing ever, which is a shame. 
The Royal Society has a disclaimer on its website saying that this text was indeed harvested via OCI. They encourage users to report any errors. And I did that and they've now, I just checked recently, they've fixed that error, which means it's discoverable. But I had to be able to find the articles in order to be able to point out the errors so they could be fixed. We've now added all that article level metadata to BHL with the correct spelling of ornithorhynchus. And that again means that readers can find that information both on our website and via Google and other search engines. And because this article had a DOI already, we've included that DOI in our metadata, which links directly out to the definitive version on the publisher's website. And we do that because a DOI is a critical part of a publication's bibliographic metadata, and it should be included as a clickable link in any mention of that publication, be it in a reference list or on a website. Finally, I'm gonna take you back in time to the very beginning. This article, published in 1799 in the Naturalist Miscellany, is arguably the most important platypus article of all. It's the article that introduced the platypus to the world, its international debut the first published scientific description and the first published illustration of this species. The Naturalist Miscellany is probably my favourite publication on BHL, uploaded from our collection here at Museums Victoria. The publication contains scientific descriptions and illustrations of over a thousand species that were sent to London from all around the world in those late, that late 1700s, early 1800s. Finding and citing these descriptions has always been difficult because this publication lacks page numbers. So even if you've got the volumes in front of you, you have to kind of flick through because you've no idea which page these descriptions are on. And until very recently, the descriptions lacked both article data and DOIs. This is Chris Healy, who's BHL Australia's digitization technician. He normally does all our rare book scanning. During 2020, he collected article level metadata for our rare books from scratch, but it was well worth the effort because so many of Australia's most iconic species are described for the first time in these pages. We're now in the process of uploading all that article data into BHL in order to make these species descriptions and their beautiful illustrations discoverable. And we're assigning a DOI to everyone. And those DOIs will resolve to the freely accessible versions on the BHL website. And I'm so completely thrilled that this platypus and all its friends are now part of that never ending chain of knowledge. And now that this article has a DOI, we can track where the people are using and citing it. This article has only had a DOI since October, but its altmetric wheel is already looking impressive. If you click through to get more information, you'll see that its new DOI appears on five Wikipedia pages, a blog, and it's been tweeted or retweeted by 201 individual Twitter accounts with an upper bound of over 700,000 followers. So it seems that I'm not the only one who's excited about Retropids. My initial tweet about this Retropid got some pretty enthusiastic responses. Both the idea of this, DOIs for all, and its actual content are absolutely brilliant. The description of the platypus is just fantastic, which it is. Good to know that an article published in 1799 can be assigned a DOI. Links like that are essential for citations and cross-referencing. It's new to me that the Biodiversity Heritage Library gives a DOI to its papers. Really cool, because it follows that the web of citations becomes much more complete. Now we need this for every other species in order to finally get non-taxonomists to cite our taxonomic papers. And then there was this one, which I think was, was tongue-in-cheek. Well, that'll do wonders for the author's H index. No, George Shaw, the author, doesn't have an H index and he doesn't have an ORCID, but, perhaps, but he does have a Wikidata ID. And that does allow us to persistently link him to all sorts of things. But I still can't connect him to his publications via the DOI registration process because Crossref still only accepts ORCIDs. Orchids, awesome, but they're useless for historic authors. And I've written to Crossref about this a couple of times and they've always been pretty enthusiastic. Their last response just this week says that their new schema will support multiple identifiers. So I'm pretty excited about that. Although there was an awesome suggestion in the Peter Palooza chat this morning, Catherine Kayser said that dead orchids should be called dorkids, which I think is really cool. So big vote for dorkids for dead people. Before I finish, it's worth mentioning that not everyone gets their biodiversity knowledge from the primary literature. Most people get it from Wikipedia. But that for me is one of the most important reasons why the historic literature needs DOIs. Wikipedia has an automatic add a citation function. You just have to drop a DOI into that box and all the bibliographic metadata attached to that DOI is beautifully formatted into a citation. And that's all I had to do to add this citation to the Wikipedia page for the illustrator of that beautiful platypus. And I've done many a manual edition of a, of a citation without a DOI because I work with historic literature. 
It's kind of clunky, lots of copying and pasting, but DOIs are awesome. Wikipedia is an incredible resource, and that's because of the tireless work of Wikipedians. DOIs make their work so much easier. And that's the point of DOIs. They make it easier for everyone to find, cite, link, share, and track scholarly content. This is my final platypus article. It's a historic insight, population changes of the platypus across time, published just last year. In the article, the authors state that evidence for decline in abundance and distribution of animals is critical. And it's possible only through the inclusion of historical information. And this is for me one of the really most important reasons why the historic literature desperately needs retributes. So thank you very much for listening. Um, again, I speak at a lot of conferences, but I really feel at home amongst the Palooza community. I talk about peers, people usually have no idea what I mean. Um, so you're my people. And so I'm really interested to get your feedback on the issues that I raised today. So I've got some poll questions that hopefully have been made visible um, and I would be really grateful if you could answer those. Um, I plan to use these responses in future talks um, and I'd also be very happy to answer any questions that you may have. So I'm going to stop sharing. You should see there are six questions. And it seems like everyone has voted hell yeah to our PIDs retro cool. Absolutely, 100%. The historic literature is retro cool. I'm just going to leave. I'm not going to go back and see if anyone says no. Not everyone's going to quit their job to help me uh, with the historic literature needing retro PIDs, but lots of people agree that it needs them. That's great. Uh, yes, people think there should be a policy for policy or at least some guidelines around putting definitive DOI versions of out-of-copyright publications behind paywalls. Possibly I should have put a question in there about who might be responsible for developing and policing such a policy. Um, I mean, obviously I don't like any out-of-copyright content being put behind paywalls, but it's particularly those DOI versions, the versions everyone must cite as part of the DOI system. That really irks me. Um, and yes, so far, oh, one person said no. Um, just should cross draft deposits allow for author peers other than orchids? That's a bit controversial. Um, but yes, happy to answer any questions. And I'm really happy to invite people to ask their questions in person. Should we really accept that non OA publishers like Wiley Plains and Lots of Public Domain Content are simply first assigning a duo for it? No, we shouldn't. Um, the question there, why not simply mint our own new DOIs or other PIDs for the same content? That's something I actually feel really strongly about. So if I, we have duplicate copies on the BHL for a whole lot of stuff that's behind paywalls elsewhere. And if you think about uh, how citation linking works, so if I were to now write an article about a platypus and there was a DOI behind a paywall for one version and then another DOI for that another version that was open access, I'd have to choose which one to cite. I really feel quite strongly that there should only be one DOI for each piece of published content because of the metrics and the citation linking. So I would, I'm actually happy to defer if there's already a DOI for a piece of content and it's behind a paywall, they got there first. And I actually much prefer to talk to them about maybe making it open access. And in fact, when I gave my talk in 2019 at Pitapalooza, I gave it, I mentioned the article in which um, Charles Darwin and Alfred Russell Wallace together published about the theory of natural evolution by natural selection. So that's probably for me the, one of the most significant publications in the whole of biology. And it was behind a paywall um, on Oxford Academic. And I said, it's ridiculous that this incredibly significant publication, so out of copyright, published in the middle of the 1800s, is behind a paywall. Within six days, Oxford Academic made that open access. And so I was thrilled because it meant that now everyone could read that. And I really think that, no, we shouldn't have created another DOI for that article, that actually there should be a policy that says, if it's out of copyright and that's the definitive version with the DOI, don't add it, don't put it behind a paywall. And Wiley has got some collections. They've got an Alfred Russell Wallace collection where they've just got like 20 articles that are free, that are his critical articles. Um, but I think in the same way that a lot of people made their COVID news on news articles um, free this year so that people could read COVID information, I kind of think that we should do the same. Yeah, and I don't think SciHub is the answer either. I want legally 
accessible versions. Um, so no, not in support of SciHub. I want legally open access versions of the out of copyright content. So if the commercial websites could just anything published before like 1923, open that up for us, please. And we won't, I will not allow the duplication of DOIs that already exist. I'm now running the Persistent Identifier Working Group, BHL, and I'm very clear on that point. We don't duplicate DOIs. Uh, let me see just a question in the chat which maybe maybe we maybe I can help with but um, there's a question about isn't Crossref providing a solution for two or more different DOIs for a single piece of content um, that is a solution if there are already existing ones um, and yes there are we've talked about that a lot about creating like a landing page that's like a single landing page that then has the DOIs. There is a huge amount of du duplication already. Um, there's duplication within BHL. Um, and we're trying to do best practice moving forward. Um, and we're gonna be quite careful now on about making sure that never happens again. It is actually really hard for the historic literature because sometimes the metadata is different for the same publication just because of the way it's collected. And as you saw, there are spelling errors. So they don't look like the same thing. So they might not be recognized as a duplicate when they go in. We're trying hard to do that. It's slower to do it that way, to be careful, but I think it's important. Um, so yes, there's, there are solutions for if they already exist um, and we probably need those solutions, but I think that ultimately best practice is that we don't create a new DOI for something that already has it. I mean, obviously there are cases for having more than one DOI for some things. And examples of those are like if there's um, a collection at the end of the year that's published about all the fish articles that were published that year and it's a collection in a journal and then it's a new publication the articles have new page numbers even though they're actually being republished there might be a case there for having a new DOI for the newly published in the collection of that fish article and there's another case that we have in BHL where we have say Charles Darwin's library on the biodiversity heritage library and, and we've digitized all of his library and in that library, there are copies of books and journals that already have DOIs, but his versions have got his annotations in them. So you've got Charles Darwin's handwriting all through these versions. And so in the same way that a collection might decide to have several copies of things because they're different, these are different. And that's, you know, Charles Darwin's copy with his handwriting in it kind of deserves its own DOI. And it's the same with BHL. We have multiple copies of things if they're different. If the color, the copy in Australia is colored differently from the copy in the Smithsonian, um, then there, there's a reason for us having two copies of that rare book on BHL. So I think there are reasons for duplicates, but generally we're really trying to avoid them. Cool. And yes, redirections certainly happen. So for Ed. <laughs> it's, and I think, um, yeah, I think, and I, I think I'd, I'd also be really interested, um, yeah, for, if at any if at any point you're you're all able to surface a lot to, to talk about your process for trying to avoid the uh, avoid duplication as well because as you said it's something that we we struggle with across um right across the community um sometimes some we're, we're sometimes victims of our own enthusiasm as you've as you pointed out um but i think um so I think we need to. Um, I think we need to wrap up there. Um, we'll collect any. If there are any additional questions that we've missed, we'll pop them in the um, the Slack for Nicole. Um, but it said, a. I really wanted to thank her for presenting twice and being so flexible in terms of the schedule. But I would also like to thank her for a fairly stonking presentation. Um, it was it was a it was a great tour through all of the work that the Biodiversity Heritage Library has been doing and has raised some really important issues. So um, if you could join me in a in a in a virtual round of applause um, for Nicole, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Love Peter Palooza. <laughs> Okay, so um, they said what I'm going to do next is I'm going to get um, I'm going to get Gareth um, Murphy up on um, stage, who's going to be our next plenary pre presenter this morning. Um, and it said lots of um, lots of um, lots of applause, um, lots of applause for Nicole. Um, right.